and uh, other uh, intelligence agencies. Um, but apparently we're also talking to the NSA and other intelligence agencies right now. And uh, even when we're making phone calls and sending text messages and emails, apparently we're just always talking to the NSA. So, hi, boys. Right. What's up, NSA? I got nothing to say to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, um, <clears throat> we've had all these revelations, uh, and increasing, continuing revelations from uh, uh, Snowden and uh, WikiLeaks, you know, a lot of journalists about um, intelligence abuses by the NSA and other agencies. Um, it seems like we don't really have the level of privacy we would want or that we thought we had, uh, you know, in our private communications. So, I mean, what are the implications of this? What... Um, what are you guys' thoughts on it? Well, I definitely think this is a this whole prism NSA prism deal they had going on, which apparently has been going on for quite a quite a bit, from what I remember reading. I think it was Dick Cheney that originally put it in uh, soon after nine eleven. It was part of the Patriot Act. Oh, uh, was it? Okay, so it was actually tied into the Patriot Act. I, I personally, I think this is like the the line in the sand. I think they've we've like literally stepped over into totalitarianism through this whole through this whole deal. I'd say it's a hallmark of a you know a totalitarian type state. I mean, this is some 1984 type stuff. Right. You know? I mean, yeah, this is no doubt. You know, I think it's a little bit. <clears throat> I think it's a little bit beyond 1984 at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know it's. It, they're spying on everyone. Every single thing that every single person in the world is doing, it seems like. Anyone who has a phone, at least. Or an internet connection. Or or anything that can be monitored by any sort of, of frequency, really. What I think is kind of interesting is I just recently read that, you know, obviously Obama, the, the administration has defended these practices by saying, well, this is necessary for uh, counterterrorism and protecting the United States security interests, right? Mm. But it seems like the NSA has also been spying on, um, there was an article, they were spying on lawyers in, in trade deals, international trade deals. So they're also listening in conversations about global trade and economics, which right. has nothing to do with counterterrorism. Right. You know, so, I mean, that seems like a pretty direct abuse there. And obviously they're, they've been caught bugging the phones of various heads of state even um politicians in other countries i mean how exactly 
is that effective in counter counterterrorism? You know, what's what's the end game there? Right. How do they define a terrorist? Yeah. Is it someone that's just is is you know, is, uh, you know expressing politi- political dissent? Are they a potential terrorist? Mm. I think I remember hearing that. Uh, I think it was straight out of Obama's mouth that he. It's instead of it being every fourth person that every fourth person away from a terrorist, they've lit, they've drawn it back to every third person. So, yeah. uh, so in other words, it's like if you're a somehow associated to a terrorist, like three people away, like let's say uh, your cousin is someone that's into some crazy political activism. They could still monitor me because I know you. I don't actually know your cousin, right? Hmm. So it's like one of those deals where, well, how do you not know somebody that might not be on their list? You know, yeah. I mean, it's like to the point where then then everyone's everyone's suspect to some degree. You know, I mean, I I've I mean, obviously, I'm doing a free radical media show. You know. But I mean, even if I were just a, you know, standard run of the mill, everyday Joe, I probably along the line have a family member or a friend or a friend's friend that is into some sort of these ideas that they might consider threatening, you yeah. know? So it's like, to me, it's just that whole, that whole idea, that whole way of defining it is just total bullshit to me. You know, oh, yeah. just be honest and say you're spying on everybody and that you're threatened by everybody, you know? Right. And it does seem like they're just threatened by everyone. Right. You know, and they're obviously <clears throat> trying to use this intelligence data to, uh, you know, to, to gain an upper hand because it's not just, you know, political dissidents, you know, it, it's to be expected that governments are going to be listening in on political dissidents. You know, right. they, they've right. always done that. Um, but just run-of-the-mill citizens, people engaged in, in business deals abroad. I mean, that that seems pretty clearly to me that they're just gathering this data for whatever nefarious purpose, you know. Mm. <clears throat> I mean, it's they're seeking an advantage, I think. Right. I don't know what type of advantage you really get out of the vast majority of people. You know I mean? Well, I, I'd imagine that the vast majority of the data they're getting is just completely irrelevant nonsense. I mean, you're finding out about, you know, what a person is going to be doing later that day or who they're dating or or their financial information, you know, personal details that have no relevance to the to what they say they're trying to to thwart, which I I mean, I I have a hard time. I have a hard time believing that half of this stuff that they're getting really almost all of the stuff they're getting has any relevance once it goes through you know they I'm sure they have a computer program that has keywords that they're looking for or you know talking about certain people or, or you know the numbers that wh- whatever those numbers are linked to you know at the end of the day I, I'd imagine that almost all of that information is completely useless so you know what and, and, and there was an article um, it's a little while back in the times where they were saying that most of these NSA officials they're they're spying on their friends and family and their and their girlfriends and fiancés and, and whatever you know what I mean what so the potential for abuse is incredible yeah, you know, right. you know, I mean what are you what are you doing I mean if this is supposed to be you know looking for terrorism then why are you checking out what you know your boyfriend or girlfriend who they're talking to I mean that plus that, what happens when some of these people are playing the stock market. You know, what, can you tap into the phone of somebody, your broker, or, you know, somebody at a mutual fund, or right. some, some kind of business official, get inside information and then use that, you know, on the, on the market? I mean, it, uh, that's just purely conjecture, but isn't the potential for that abuse there? I mean, if you have the capability to tape, or to tap any device that a person has, then yeah, you know, I mean, obviously, if you are unethical, then yeah, you can you can go and do that. And I mean, the practice itself seems a little bit unethical, just the NSA program itself. So, and I, I think it's not only in unethical, I, I honestly think it's unconstitutional, it's illegal. Um, let me, I, I wanted to read the text of the Fourth Amendment. Um, <clears throat> if we could pull that up real quick. Um, because it seems pretty clear to me that this this is you know a tacit violation of the Fourth Amendment. Um, the amendment reads as follows: The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects 
against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Okay? Now, some key points here. Um, look at the line, papers. Okay? Now, obviously, when this document was written, you know, this is a living document, um, we didn't have electronic communication at the time. Um, so papers, that, that was, would be thought to mean someone's personal correspondence, um, their business papers, um, memoirs, journals, right, official and unofficial documents, you know, their papers. Now, look, we do all that electronically now, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that it's um, not the spirit <coughs> of the amendment, right? In the spirit of the amendment, those items are private and can only be uh, looked at or seized um, through a reasonable uh, assumption of wrongdoing, mm. and it has to be issued by a judge, right? Supported by oath or affirmation. Um, and it seems like this blanket surveillance is directly counter to the spirit of this amendment. And it's, you know, interesting to me that President Barack Obama is a constitutional law professor who doesn't seem to have any regard for this and other amendments of the Constitution. I mean, I mean that's, that's a little unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the last part of, of this amendment really describes just this overall blanket thing that the NSA is, where it says, you know, that the, that the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized need to be very specific. So, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're just blanketing everybody, and you're capping everything that they're doing, then that there is no specific there. You're you're targeting everyone. So, you know, yeah, you you can find something if you look in enough places. But you know, what exactly are you finding? And a lot of times, you're finding petty nonsense that really has no relevance to what you say you're doing. You know, this was set up. The Patriot Act was set up as a knee-jerk reaction to 9/11, yeah. where, you know, we we said, okay, you know, we're gonna we're gonna set this up, which would really the Patriot Act in and of itself is unconstitutional. So we set this up, and now here we are, 13 years later, mm. we're still under this act. We we continue to well, now they say that they're gonna start scaling it back, but you know, we didn't. People didn't start even talking about this NSA stuff until Edward Snowden came out and released that. What all the people who were saying, "Oh, it's just crazy conspiracy people saying that the government's, you know, listening to everything we're doing," then you know he releases these papers and we find out, "Oh, wow, you know, they really were doing all these right. things." So, and it makes you wonder. I mean, I know they. Uh, what was it? Uh, Thursday they had the day we fight back um, by the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Where you where you call your senator, your state senator, and um, write them an email telling them that they need to do something about this. If they never let us know that they were doing it to begin with, and it's blatantly unconstitutional, do we honestly think they're going to listen to us? I mean, is this the solution that we really should be focusing on? Right. You know, I mean, it's it's about diversity of tactics and in, in resistance to things like this. I mean. Yeah, sure, contact your uh, representatives, you know, but also the, the only times any kind of change has ever uh, come about in this country or other democracies is when popular movements begin, people go out in the streets and they force, through popular opinion, the people in power to counter these, uh, these things. Now, I don't, know, I don't know if it's too late for all this, you know, I mean, once they get entrenched in this kind of surveillance, they really are not going to want to give it up, but, right. you know, it's, it's unacceptable. You know, and um, people like Edward Snowden are really kind of the key to this. You know, and, and <clears throat> you know, thank you, Mr. Snowden. Yes. Um, it was absolutely, in my opinion, the right thing to do. With a someone of conscience would do an act like that. Heroic you know? in every sense of the word. Right, and um, and I I appreciate you know his his actions, but <laughs> you know now we have to see what we're uh, what we're gonna do about it. You know, he's releasing this stuff through um, Glenn Greenwald, who's a fantastic journalist. Um, recently started a, an online paper called The Intercept, which to 
mainly it seems to be to release some of these documents, you know. Right. And I like their strategy of releasing them um, through a timely, you know, formulated pattern hmm. so that they can maintain the news cycle, keep the news cycle, keep this in the public mind. You know, I think that's the right strategy. Um, and it seems like the revelations just get more and more shocking. Mm. Yeah. It makes you wonder what what else is to come. You know, the the thing that amazes me is when when this initially happened, you know, Barack Obama says, Well, you know, yes, the, you know, these are these are shocking claims and we should you know, we should look into this and reform the tactics of the NSA. But I mean, you you knew that was already happening. You knew what was going on. I mean, you're the president of the United States. How could you not know what was going on? This is yeah. your administration. You know, you are the executive in charge of these agencies. You know, I mean, how where do you, you think that these news briefs were coming from? You know, you're getting all this information given to you on your desk. You have these daily briefings. Where I mean, where did you think this information was coming from? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just I, I don't think Barack Obama has any interest in giving up these executive powers. You know, I, I really don't. Despite being a constitutional uh, law professor, I, I, I think he, whether for, you know, good-spirited reasons or not, really believes that he needs these powers and wants to maintain these powers. Right. I mean, he ignored even some of the recommendations of his own panel to scale back some of these things. Mm. You know, I, I mean, if that doesn't tell you something, I don't know what does. Right, right. I mean, one thing I think that people need to remember is you know, the, the, what they're what they're saying is that the NSA is is helping to thwart terrorism. Okay, now let's think back here last year for the Boston bombings. Now the NSA program was in full effect during that time. After that happened, they said that one of the kids was talking about the bombing on his Facebook page before mm -hmm. it happened. Now, if you are really using this program the way you say you're using it wouldn't you have caught that right you know I mean there's a difference between just giving up freedom and you know they say well you know if you want to if you want to have your your freedom protected then you need to give up some freedom now that is a completely contradictory statement you're if, if you give up any freedom then you're not free so if you couldn't even catch a couple kids who made a bomb out of some fireworks you know, I mean, what are you looking for? I, I have yet to see evidence that this program has in any way, shape, or form protected us from foreign and domestic terrorism. I have yet to see any right. evidence of that, and I am deeply skeptical of that claim. And that's what we should be demanding. How is this, how is this, save, how is this protecting us? Right. We demand evidence. Yeah, I want transparency. If you're going to have this kind of... You know, abuse of power. There needs to be public transparency. Absolutely. You know, I mean, this is just—it's—it's—it's it's, it's ludicrous and it's maddening. You know, and it's uh, yeah, it it makes me very deeply angry. These abuses. You know, um, you know, it's it's much too far. Yeah, you know, and we live in the modern world. You know, I mean, these are challenges that are only going to continue unless we. Like you said, draw a line in the sand right now and say, no, we will not accept this. You know, even for security, you know, I'm of the opinion, you know, I, I don't want to give up those freedoms for security. I mean, what, what's what's that quote? Um, he who would uh, he who would trade his liberty for security deserves neither. Yeah. It was what, uh, Jefferson, maybe? Or, or um, maybe Franklin. Pat, um... Ben Franklin, possibly, but it sounds like Jefferson. But, um, <clears throat> but it's a well-known quote. You can you can find it. Um, but I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. You know, I have no interest in in trading my liberty for security. Right. You know, um, and it's <laughs> you know so, some of the other things that they've used uh, this program for. I mean, uh, if you want to talk about drone strikes for a minute? Glenn Greenwald just put out. Um, some of the latest information about how they target uh, these drones, and and it has to do with like NSA CIA metadata metadata uh, gathering. Um, you know, they take data from a cell phone and pinpoint the location of the cell phone, and then they send a drone there. 
well, there's almost no accountability. Like, who whose cell phone is that? Yeah. You know, whose pocket is it? Is it in? You know, I mean, <laughs> they have no idea. They could be standing in the middle of a nursing home for God's sake. Right. You know, and they don't know. I mean, these guys know know what's going on. They trade cell phones. You know, we don't know who we're pointing these things at. And sadly, a lot of times, it's women and children and civilians, you know, who are on the other end of these things. That, you know, that <clears throat> that's one of the problems, is when you're, when you're using this, this technology and, you know, you're, you're taking innocent lives because of that, then you can't tell me that this is doing the job that it is supposedly intended to do. I don't think that this program was put in place to kill innocent people. Hmm. You know, I mean, if we're if we're trying to kill terrorists, then you know you should probably be pretty damn sure that the precision guided missile that you're sending down from a drone that's being piloted by somebody miles and miles away is hitting the right target. Because, you know, when you're flying over a target in your, in your fighter jet, at least there's a person there trying to figure out what's going on. And you, and you notice the area, you know, you might think in your head, man, something's not right here. But if you can't, you know, it's almost like a video game. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, and, and that takes away a lot of the human element. A lot of these people who are flying these drones, you know, they're not even, they're not even realizing. Yeah, they're just detached. And, and sometimes, though, I mean, there, there is video. I mean, I... Uh, I heard a story from one of these former drone operators. He said he was he was, you know, at the command and control. He gets a message in from SIGINT, you know, the intelligence targeting uh, programs. You know, his his commanding officer <laughs> tells him to take this shot, and he's looking at like you know a a trailer or something, and he sees uh, like this shape walk around from the side of the building. Well, he takes the shot, you know, blows the place up. And it's quiet on the air, and he says, you know, was was that a kid who just walked around the corner? His CO comes back, no, that was a dog. And he says, a dog walking on two legs? CO doesn't say anything, right? So you've got this kind of this kind of stuff going on, and, and then, you know, we do something called a double tap. We'll hit a target, and then when people come in to clean up, or, you know, first responders, let's say, we hit them again. You know, to click because they're aiding and abetting terrorism, right? So, right. You know, quote unquote. But the thing is, that doesn't endear you to that community. All that does is send people, you know, because Al Qaeda comes in, terrorist organizations come in afterwards and they say, well, we're, we'll pay for the funerals, you know, <clears throat> we'll help your families. And what does that do? Well, it sends people into the arms of these terrorist organizations. You know, we're creating more enemies that we're getting rid of here with right. the, this program. And not, like, that's. Besides it being a huge abortion of justice, it's also counterintuitive, you know. And it's just, it, uh, it's just shocking the level of irresponsibility. Yes. And, and, and the pure irony. It's like we're targeting terrorists by creating totally unfettered terror. Right. You know. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, it's... <laughs> they it's not even ironic anymore it's just it's just stupidity you know we're 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 calling you know in America we we say that you know we're fighting for the downtrod you know we're we're supposed to be this voice for the people who don't have a voice and and to and to save people from from regimes and governments that are oppressing the people and causing atrocities I mean that's that's literally all we've done since Vietnam is just went into countries and done more harm than good. So, you know, I, I think I think this the the po- the politics of this country, the foreign politics of this country, we really need to look at what it is that we're doing now. You know, I mean, you could say, yeah, we've taken a step back and sort of, but I mean, there's a lot of things that we have done that. It turns out to be the complete opposite. I mean, you know, when you really go back to the history, especially when uh, when you find out, you know, really what started the whole NSA thing with the with the Patriot Act, it was nine eleven. We say nine eleven that you know it was it was Al Qaeda that, that did this that did this terrorist strike. We you know we blame it on Osama bin Laden. We put Osama bin Laden in power during when when uh, when the Taliban was overthrowing the Afghani government at the time. 
So, you know, let's not forget about that we caused our own problem that we are currently having. So, you know, we need to really, when, whenever you're deciding to overthrow a government or take out, you know, a person of interest that you think is going to be a detriment to whatever it is that you're doing, you should probably think about it and really know what it is that you're about to do because now we see what happened. You know, here we are, what, 30 years later since since we had put Bin Laden in power and now we're dealing with his regime and, and you know, these, these people, obviously they still have some influence over in the Middle East or else, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't still be over there chasing these guys. And, you know, I mean, what do the people on the ground in the Middle East think when you ask them about what America is doing? I mean, I can't imagine seeing hellfire missiles coming out of the air and blowing up buildings all around you and killing your friends and innocent people I can't imagine that that looks good in the eyes of the people who we say we're trying to help the, all you need to do is watch that recent video of those uh, Pakistanis throwing rocks at that crashed drone you know that's what they think of it you know I mean the, the, the constant terror people in that region must feel and it's not just you know Pakistan you know it's Yemen Places all over the world, you know, the CIA <clears throat> is in control of this program. You know, it's 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 shocking, and you know, it's <laughs> American citizens aren't even off limits. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, I think the first one was Anwar al uh, Awlaki, um, American citizen. Now, this guy, you know, had some serious ties to terrorist organizations. All right, but as an American citizen, you are entitled to a trial by the Constitution, right, under those laws. I'm very uncomfortable with the idea that any American citizen can be targeted as an enemy combatant and executed, assassinated, without any kind of uh, due process of law. I mean, we killed his 16-year-old right. son, we've killed other American citizens in these drone strikes. They were not, you know, able to avail themselves of a trial. And that's, that's blatantly unconstitutional. I mean, that's highly illegal. Um, again, Barack Obama, constitutional law professor, had the final say on those strikes. Right. They were on his desk. He made the decision to deny those people a trial. An American president denying American citizens the right to due process of law. That's what that is. It's, uh, well, it's unfortunate. Yeah, and it's and I think the key here is for people to to be aware of literally like you just said that this was Obama making the final call on this. Mm -hmm. He had full awareness of what was going on, and I, that's the whole problem, really. I think the the mass American public is just so entrenched in the quote unquote spectacle that they're not even aware of how serious this really is. Yeah. Like we are a hair away from a full blown totalitarian dictatorship here, people. I mean, this is not this is not a joke. This is not some radical nonsense. This is fact, and it's happening on on a consistent basis. If you want to see more evidence, look at the business news. You got the CIA, who are you know the head of this program, making a six hundred million dollar deal with Amazon to store their metadata. Yeah, you've got a big American company, one of the you know key online presences and companies, right? Who are aiding and abetting the CIA? Okay, you know, I mean, that information that they're storing is attached to the drone program. It is attached to the surveillance state. Mm -hmm. You know, so where does that publicly traded uh, company right. draw the line then between? Uh, being an entity of the state and being a public entity. Right. Right. And I mean, not just Amazon. I mean, you know, let's look at Verizon and AT&T and, and internet providers that are, that are willingly allowing the government to go in and, you know, collect the data that's being done on their mobile devices, you know, on the, on the internet. You know, when you post something on, on the internet, on like a Facebook or a Twitter, you know, you're you are putting that out there for public domain. But you know, when you're on your phone and you're having a personal conversation, that's not really public domain. You know, it's through a provider who you have a contract with, who you're supposed to have a privacy agreement with. 
-hmm. And now they're just giving away all your information to the government under really no pretense other than, well, they could potentially be involved in illegal activity. Right. Right. It's for your own protection. And, you know, it shouldn't be up to those companies. You know, the government goes directly to those companies for a lot of that information. If you want information about my metadata or my correspondence, you need to serve me directly with a warrant. I mean, that's how I read the Fourth Amendment. I think that's how a lot of people read the Fourth Amendment. Mm. It's not, you know, uh, Verizon or T-Mobile that gets to make the decision or gets served with a warrant for my personal correspondence. You know, or Google in the case of, uh, you know, email or Yahoo, you know, right. any of those entities. If you want personal information on someone, you need to serve them with a warrant that has been th vetted through the court system. Right. You know, and look, I don't really trust a lot of the court system either to make these decisions, but that's more transparent and better than this, you know, backdoor, you know, uh, surveillance state system. You know, one of the things, too, you know, okay, so so people out there listening, you know, I'm sure there's people that are going to say, well, you know, if you, you know, if you go through the whole process of trying to serve a warrant, what if that person executes a terrorist attack, you know, in the time before you get to serve the warrant? Well, you know, if you're doing your homework, if you're doing just old basic CIA surveillance, then you know who you need to serve the warrant to if you're actually paying attention to who's a threat and who's not. You don't have to worry about... 10,000 other people or 10 million other people under one provider if you know that just one person that you're trying to look for is a threat. You know, what, what are all the other people serving? I mean, what, what's the point of going through their data? You know, on the, on the off chance that you find one other person that may or may not do something down the road, you know, I mean, it, it's just this, it, it's a blatant, let's see, how much information we can get. Let's see how far we can push people in and pull this whole bullshit of saying, well, you know, you I mean to be free, you know, you got to give up freedom. That is, that is completely ludicrous that mm -hmm. you're not free. If you give up one freedom, you're not free. If you're living under constant surveillance and constant watch and everything you do is bugged and everything you say is monitored. That's not freedom. That nice. is absolutely. Um, Chris Hedges, uh, calls it, uh, inverted totalitarianism mm. the idea that you know we're oh yeah we're doing this all for freedom keep you safe keep you free and you know all these corporations they tell you oh your your data is private with us you know they they emphasize it no no it's not right. no none of these institutions have our interests in mind let's just let's just come clean and face the fact not one of these corporations i don't care how, how much they demonstrate the dissent with the government going through their data not one of them at, at the end of the day is doing a damn thing about it and really cares about the individual's privacy well, they're looking at their bottom line you know you know if they did care you know they could they could go through the process of law of fighting the warrant and saying that sure. hey, you know you can't you can't be taken because they're still getting the information I mean they got the money mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah if anyone has the money to fight these warrants that are placed on them for just arbitrary metadata collection, it's the multi-billion dollar companies, right. you know, not the average person. You know, if, if, if they were just attacking the average people, then yeah, a lot of those people might not, you know, be able to fight a lot of the, a lot of the warrants and stuff. But yeah, these companies have billions of dollars. You know, they, if, if you care, if you don't want people, you know, going and, uh, and being, you know, being watched like that, then, then fight it. Mm. Right. I mean, if you really care about the rule of law in the United States as a company, as a corporation, you're not signing a six million dollar contract with the CIA. You know, obviously they care more about that six hundred million and the potential growth, in, you know, within the public sector that they'll get from that deal than they do about transparency or or, or justice. Right privacy it's just uh, it, it's it's just it's a total shame on every level mm. from top to bottom and I personally my opinion is on the matter the only solution is for some crazy genius computer scientist to invent a form of the internet that's totally encrypted 
because I don't I don't even think fighting this in court, uh, sending mess, sending calling our senators, sending emails to our senators, protesting. I don't think any of this is going to get them to listen. At the end of the day, we need to just come up with a new solution, something that's that they they can't ha- they don't have any control over, and just all jump ship. Well, and that's the thing, you know, the, the internet, the internet is, is, is a blessing in a lot of ways. It allows for instantaneous communication between individuals across the world, you know, and this is a truly can be a revolutionary space for, for human change and mm-hmm. positive social justice. At the same time, you have governments who are also, you know, going in and trying to take control of it. Aware just of like, that fact. Exactly. <laughs> You know, any 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 basis for revolutionary change, governments are going to want to have a control method. Okay, so this is, and they've been doing this for a lot of years. You know, trying to pass various bills through uh, governments across the world, trying to maintain some kind of state control over the internet, and I think that's a very negative thing for the potential future of the internet. It could kill it. Yeah, it could just totally ruin it. Right. You know, so I, I mean, I think it is important, and you know, there have been a lot of good internet activists. You know, a lot of people are rallying around this uh, this issue, which is good. Yeah. You know, um, I'll say though that you know, I'm I, I am not a fan of single issue campaigns. I mean, I think any kind of activism should be rooted in you know concepts of intersectionality and and the knowledge that to truly change anything, you have to change everything. Right. Right. So just keep that in mind in your activism. But definitely internet freedom is a pretty good issue to rally around if it interests you, you know, and uh, and it should interest you because increasingly we're all tied to the internet yeah. all day long. And it affects all of us, and I think that's what needs to be emphasized is how, you know, yeah, you may not have any connections to any terrorists, but your data is still has the potential to be snooped through and I think people really need to fully comprehend that fact and that's an argument too that drives me nuts that we should mention here because I'm sure a lot of people will be thinking it well if you're not doing anything wrong then you don't have anything to worry about right. well who gets to decide whether or not what you're doing is wrong that's what you should ask yourself what happens tomorrow if you know they're looking through your personal correspondence and somebody decides that that's threatening no matter what it is right you know i mean it could th- the wind can change really easily you know and if you don't think you're doing anything wrong well tomorrow you might be in the eyes of somebody in power right you know you should be worried about this no matter what you're doing this is true i mean you never know you know the you know like you were saying earlier pat you know if you, if you they they can they can look and see you know a, a person three people away from from the person of you know, who might be doing something. Well, if you work for if you work for a large company and somebody in that company you know just all of a sudden decides to go off and kill a bunch of people, you know, and you were having correspondence with them not not about that but you know just because you work in the company with them you know you have to you have to have a correspondence with them for for whatever it is you're doing right. at that business. Now all of a sudden you and your entire family are being watched because some crazy person decided to go off and kill some people. Right. You know what I mean? And you had nothing to do with it. You didn't know. But now all of a sudden now you're being watched. You know, I mean what 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 is that what what purpose is that serving? You know, I mean it's it's incredible. It's incredible the what what this program does. And how people are, they're, a lot of people are okay with it. You know, like, like we were saying, well, yeah, I'm not doing anything wrong. Well, yeah, you're right, you're not doing anything wrong, but they're doing something wrong by making sure if you're doing something wrong or not. You know, I mean, that's that's what local law enforcement's for. That's, you know, there's yeah. there's standards and practices that go into figuring out whether or not somebody is breaking the law, not just, right. you know. And who, who defines what's wrong? I mean... I mean, right, I mean, they're saying terrorism, but what does even terrorism mean? Right. You know? They're not limiting limiting it to terrorism. And actually, you know, you made the point about local law enforcement. A lot of local police forces are getting into this, too. I mean, they're getting into this surveillance state, you know? So, I mean, just on the ground level, just locally, the police at the local PD can have access to this information increasingly. And that's that's pretty terrifying too. The more people who have access to this, 
the more potential for abuse there is. Mm. You know, I mean, this information gets into the wrong hands. I mean, I, I mean, it's already in the wrong hands. But <laughs> as more people get a hold of this information, the potential, you know, for it, it, it's it's shocking. I mean, local PDs. Why do they need this level of surveillance on civilians? It almost gets to the, you know, when you really look at the trend of where we're heading, it's going to get to the point where, you know, they're going to be, you know, they're, they're almost trying to stop crime before it happens. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's say, I don't know, just, just for a, just for an easy example, let's say you know, you're out at a bar, you had too much to drink, you've been posting pictures on, on your, on your social media sites, or maybe, maybe putting a putting a thing up on Twitter saying, oh, I'm so wasted right now. Well, now let's say that, you know, the, the local cops, they're able to figure out where you, what bar you're at. You know, they're able to figure out, you know, where, what time, you know, obviously they'll know what time it was posted. So then all of a sudden you walk out the bar, here's a couple of cops waiting to arrest you for being drunk. You know, or, or as soon as you step into your car, now they're right by your car, you know, arresting you. You know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's obviously it's illegal to drink and drive, but you know these these things. You know when when it's it's this instantaneous. You know, oh, you do one single thing that is is wrong. Now all of a sudden you're being put in jail. I mean, we might get to a point where eighty percent of the population I mean, is going to be is going to be in prison. Yeah. I mean, we're already you know for a first world country, we already incarcerate more people per capita than any other country that's a first world country. So you know what? I mean, how many more people we're going to put in jail? You know, I mean. It, it's almost like you gotta you you either gotta adhere to whatever it is that they say is you know is is what you gotta do or else you're you're gonna be put in jail because you might be a threat to something. Right. I mean, it reminds me of that that film. There was a sci-fi film some years ago called Minority Report. I think it was right. where they uh, you know the premise was that they did all this surveillance and number crunching so they could predict whether or not you were likely to commit a crime and then they would arrest you before you committed the crime. Right. You know, and that's another example of science fiction kind of predicting things that are kind of happening now. You yeah. know, it, that's that's scary, terrifying. Yeah, it's absolutely terrifying. And again, the the majority just does not get it. People like us do, but it hasn't seeped in to the mainstream yet. And you know. I can't say I fully blame them. If all you watch is the mainstream media and read, uh, follow mainstream outlets, you're not going to fully understand the potential of this. But th this is a this is this really is, in, in, in my opinion, the deciding issue of what road we go down. Sure, you know the media will portray a guy like Edward Snowden or Chelsea Manning as these traitorous, you know, treasonous villains, you know. And even when they don't portray them like that, they at least portray them as, okay, well, you know, here were these uh, these leaked documents, and the government says this, and the documents say this, and now, you know, you decide. You know, this kind of false objectivity. When really, I mean, present that information, because it's shocking, and a lot of things that the government says about it are blatantly false. Right. It's not journalism just to say, well, this happened, and the government says this, and let's move on to the Olympic scores. Right. You know, that's not journalism. You know, what Glenn Greenwald is doing is, is journalism. You know, taking these documents, releasing them at certain times, talking about it, starting a conversation. That's journalism. Right. You know, you turn on MSNBC or Fox News or CNN, you're not getting that. Right. You know, I think another thing that people should remember is how many other times throughout the history that a revelation has been brought to light by this quote-unquote whistleblower. And, you know, we don't find out a lot of things until a person like this exposes it. And it's happened multiple times in the history of this country. And, you know, we wouldn't have a lot of the laws that were put in place, you know, to, to well, before the NSA thing, you know, I mean, trying to curb warrantless taps and, and thing, a lot of things in the 70s that the CIA were doing and they got exposed. You know, these things wouldn't have been known unless there were people like Snowden, of the Snowdens of the past, who, who did these things, you know. 
it's not about just sitting there and going back and forth on whether or not Snowden is a terrorist or, or you know, or deserves to be put in jail. That's not what this is about. This is about the information that he leaked. And they say, oh, well, you know, this this screwed up the way we're, we're figuring out, you know, who's a terrorist and who's not. Well, like I said earlier, you know, we had the Boston bombings. That was before all the revelations of Snowden. You know, they were, those people were being watched before that, and we didn't stop that. So, mm. you know, what you know, what are we stopping? I mean, mm, how many right. things have we stopped? I I don't know. Release it. Release how much things is done. Release a detailed report. You right. Know? I mean, and I don't think that's too much to ask. I really don't. You know, if if you're going to stand up there and you're going to say how this is for our own good, then show us why it's for our own good. You know, you're not. You're not by by releasing a statement in, in facts like that. You're not curbing any of, of potential things down the road. You're just showing, okay, here was something and we thwarted it, and this is how we thwarted it, and this is why we thwarted it. This is the these were the this is how it led to that. I mean, you know, it. There's no, there's no, no accountability. Reasons. Yeah, there's no reasons being given why this why this is needed and why we're continuing to do it. Yeah, there, there really aren't, you know, and, uh, you know, we have a history of, of people, um, Daniel Ellsberg, that's who it was, uh, released the Pentagon Papers in the 70s about uh, Vietnam, right? Uh, information about how the American people were misled about the war in Vietnam, you know, information about abuses from several presidential administrations regarding Vietnam, you know. And, you know, Ellsberg wasn't met with uh, the degree of vitriol that, you know, Snowden or Manning has been met with, you know. But still, we should have, we should, we need people like this to be releasing this information because it doesn't seem like the government has any interest in doing it. <laughs> right. And it doesn't seem like they have any interest in really defending the programs other than, you know, well, we're not going to change it. So, tough luck. Telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Right, absolutely. You know, I mean, that was uh, Orwell. Right. You know, and <laughs> it's a cliche to say, this is Orwellian. You know, I mean, this is... We're here. You know, you know? yeah, we've arrived. Now what are we going to do about it? And it's only going to get worse. It's oh, yeah. only going to get worse unless we do something about it. And how we do it is... is I think what we should all be focusing on, you know, um, I think the first step, like I was saying, is awareness, mm -hmm. showing the the modern, the average folk how this is going to affect them, because it's gonna it's going to affect everybody, even if you're not doing something quote unquote wrong. Um, it, you're 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 still gonna at some point be tied into this whole web. Um. And it's just terrifying on, on all, all across the board absolutely terrifying right and it's hard to understand why I mean you know we have the spectacle we have uh, kind of a lethargic populace in the west but it's hard to understand why people are more angry it really is especially you know you, you go down to Brazil you look at some of the issues that happen there people are in the streets over you know public transit increases you know it was something like 10 cents yeah no, there was also it was also involved with uh, the World Cup uh, being down there. Right, and there but were other domestic issues. The uh, the transit was what set it over the edge where people started riding, and that's just one example. I mean, you can look all around the world at so many people that were been pissed off about so much less than what's happening in this in this country. You know, we look at I mean, let's look at the financial crisis in two thousand eight, and now you have the NSA stuff. You know, um. I mean, how many, how many, ma I mean, those are two huge things. How many major events need to happen for people to finally be like, this is enough. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is absurd. And it's not about rioting. That's not, I, you know, when I talk to a lot of people, they say, well, you know, we live in this first world country yeah. of democracy. You know, that's not how you do things. Well, I mean, there are other first world countries that have rioted before, but it's not about destroying things. And, you know, and that's not, that's not a civil way to go about things, but you know the civil way to go about things. Nobody's doing that. 
You know, we're, we're not doing that. So Mass complacency. Look at the wake of the financial crisis in, in uh, Iceland. They replaced their entire government, prosecuted, you know, uh, their bankers. You know, I mean, they used the rule of law to dramatically alter their, uh, their system because they said, well, you know what, it didn't work, so now we're going to make a new one. Hmm. And I'm here in the United States, we're coming up on midterm elections here. And if, if our democratic process really reflected any of the major changes going on, I mean, there would be dramatic, dramatic changes, but there's not going to be. I mean, the, the House of Representatives is going to look largely the same. The Senate is going to look largely the same after the midterms. You know, I mean, there's probably still going to be a Republican majority in the House, and there's probably still going to be a Democratic majority in the Senate, and it's going to look almost exactly the same, unless, you know, a lot of interesting, unforeseen things happen in the next few months. But, you know, the fact is, we're still going to be left with this you know, bipartisan, quote-unquote, gridlock um, between the two parties. We're still going to have uh, the Obama administration. We're still going to have the same basic policies. You know, that's what the ballot box gets you in this country. Mm. More of the same. You know, the biggest problem with that is, you know, this, this is supposed to be a representative democracy. These representatives are supposed to represent what the people want, and they're not doing that. They're not, they're not bringing these issues to light you know, they're not attacking them. They're not, you know, if if they're not going to do that, then in the Constitution, we have the right to go to the government and say, you're not doing what we want you to do. But no one does that. You know, now, one of the things I find interesting is um, this Rand Paul. Yeah, uh, you he's going to bring that up. He's yeah. going to, he, he's suing the, the, uh, the Obama administration. Now... You know, I, I mean, I guess we we could probably sit here and talk about Rand Paul, and we could talk about the Tea Party, but really, that's that's not the point here. The point is, this is only one person is is doing this, right? I mean, shouldn't we have shouldn't we have done this a long time ago? You know, maybe back in two thousand one during the Bush administration when this was first done. You know, I mean, right? We didn't put our foot down when it, when it was in its infancy, and now look what it's turned into. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I'm 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 glad Rand Paul is uh is doing that. I'm glad he's suing the administration. Now, Rand Paul himself, I don't agree with most of his politics. Right. You know, but at least he's doing this, you know, and uh and it's certainly you would think other, you know, libertarian minded members of government would uh would throw their hats into that, you know. If they weren't thinking about their political careers, I guess. I mean, Rand Paul's obviously thinking about his political career. This probably helps him, mm. you know, considering his voter base. But, you know, it's it's still, you know, this one single congressman is suing the administration when every American has a legal claim against this program, you know. Hmm. It's going to be interesting to see what does end up happening with this. If it goes anywhere, first of all, which it may very well not. You know, I, I mean, there's been there's been small little suits here and there, and they've kind of went both ways. And you know, this is the first major one where it's actually, you know, where he says he's going to take it to the Supreme Court. Yeah. And you know, the Supreme Court's another thing that's a really interesting part of the government. You know, we're supposed to have these checks and balances, but you know, when everybody's on the same page. I mean, where's the checks and balances? Right. Right, absolutely. You know, I mean, the Supreme Court's probably um, the, the only thing right now that could legally say this is unconstitutional and needs to stop, right? The Supreme Court has that power. Um, another thing that could be done, you know, is from local state governments um, can certainly uh, have an influence here. I mean, you know, s state legislatures can get together and... and uh, form an amendment to the Constitution, right? And that is one way you could use your democracy if you wanted to. I mean, look, it's the local level. The, the, the only way you could really influence anything in this country is on, at your local level. Um, so if you personally get your state, local, uh, you know, political officials involved, get them to care about it, get things changed in the state legislature, it's uh, a lot easier than trying to change things on the national level. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, if you're, if you're, 
interested, you could even, you know, run for office yourself and, you know, try to, uh, try to influence things, you know. Um, the two-party system's pretty entrenched. It's kind of hard for anybody who doesn't have Democratic or Republican support to get elected. You know, that's a major flaw in our, if you want to call it, democracy in the United States. But, you know, I mean, radical change is possible even within our current system. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one tactic we can use to try to change this that's really the biggest thing you know you gotta you gotta use the laws in your advantage you gotta use them the way that they were intended to be used you know the constitution and the bill of rights are fantastic documents but the vast majority of people don't even know what they say and if they did know what they say and they knew that they were protected under these laws to be able to go to the government and say hey you know we don't like what you're doing you need to stop this you know, that's the point of those laws, is for the people to be able to stop their government from doing the acts that they're doing right now. And if you don't do it, then, you know, don't be surprised when it gets worse. Don't be surprised when, you know, you got some government agents knocking on your door because you're apparently now a threat to whatever, for whatever reason they, they deem Right. And, and you know, then they then they throw you in jail, and now it's your duty then to defend yourself as not being a threat. And I mean, you know, like we were saying, you know, what what defines a threat? What defines a terrorist? You know, I mean, what they can say whatever they want. You know, they can say whatever 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 action you did. They can somehow, I'm sure, figure out a way to make it seem like that makes you a threat. I mean. Uh, uh, it, it really gets to me. It really strikes a nerve when people will say to me, "Oh, why do you care? You've got it good. You live in America. You live in the best country in the world. You, you, you live in, in the suburbs. You know why do you care?" And it's like, if we don't care now and do something with this now, this is this is going to get massively worse so it takes a little bit of foresight but it already is massively worse depending on where you live and what you're involved with so i think it's it you know that whole complacency that permeates our society just makes me sick to be honest with you it's like take a little bit of uh, of incentive and educate yourself of the the horrible potential this has to totally enslave us right and and remember that the restriction on the on the freedom of one human being is a restriction on the freedom of all human beings. Mm. These programs are directly uh, connected to the assassination of people in other countries. Okay, these programs are directly connected to abuses of power at the highest levels of our government. It affects everyone, and certainly, if something's happened in the United States, you know, especially in terms of foreign policy, it affects the entire world. You know, we set. A lot of policies around the world we'd still have that power in America right mm. you know I use the term we to say the United States you know I don't mean the term we really but it's <clears throat> the fact is if you aren't paying attention to this it's well it's it's gonna affect you and it affects people you know and it affects people you've never met and and it doesn't matter if these abuses are happening here or elsewhere, if they're happening to other human beings, they are happening to you. You know, we are united together as a species. You know, right. something that happens across the globe is going to affect you. You know, and having the empathy to stand up and say, well, you know, I don't agree with this. I don't want to be part of it. I want it to change. It takes a lot of courage, and it's, it's something that I think people... You know, people need to wake up and realize that, yes, this is going to affect you. Mm.